Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. This was one of my favourite ones I've done so far. I spoke to a great lady called Mel Crate, who's the founder of Luminate, who were working with people to help improve mental health in the workplace and, and all of that good stuff. We covered a few things. We talked about why we find it difficult to stick to healthy habits, why, how come you can redesign our habits for better health, and we talk about energy levels, so eating the right stuff, exercising, meditation. Um, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, and we're live. Thanks for joining me, Mel. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Pleasure, pleasure. So what is your background? So um, I run a wellbeing consultancy called Luminate. We work with businesses to try and help them create happier and healthier environments. Uh, So I've run that business now for almost four years, which feels like a lifetime. (laughs) Um, And before that, I worked in broadcasting. So I worked Uh, um, as a talent agent for almost a decade and then decided I wanted to retrain. It's very stressful. I had my own experience of mental illness in my 20s. Oh, wow. Um, And overcoming that, decided I wanted to work in the wellness area, which is what led me to set up Luminate, and here we are. Interesting. So so talent being models and... Uh, It was presenters, actually. So newsreaders, um, factual documentary presenters, people like that, which was really interesting at the time. And yeah, so glad I did it. But it wasn't for me forever. No, true. And then your own own mental health experience, has that Mm. stood you in good stead now for... Yeah, here. definitely. Like a lot of our work is talking about mental health and trying to educate and build awareness um, and give people the confidence to deal with mental health a bit more effectively at work. So definitely having my own experience of that, I think just gives you a first hand insight to know what it's like to experience mental illness, know what helps at those times, know what certainly doesn't help. Um, and that has definitely helped when kind of building that side of the business. So do you think there's like a mixture of um, like environment, chemical Yes. Stuff so and- mental health and mental illness in particular is very complex, but our environment is incredibly important. And, you know, that includes society as a whole where we live. But um, in terms of our workplace environments, we spend so much time in them in our waking life. So it is incredibly important that that environment is conducive to positive mental health and not doing the opposite, doing more damage, which is sometimes the case, sadly. I, I just did a podcast on flexibility in the workplace, like oh, flexi working. Yeah. I did a little Instagram survey okay. um, on my stories and um, 59% of people said that their companies offer flexi working. But um, I just find it really interesting because people always talk about work-life balance and the opposite of life yes. is death. Yes. And people are equating work to death. So they're coming in to work, not really wanting to mm. work, let's say. And then with flexi working, you're kind of... Sp- most people want to try to spend more time at home so they're not having human contact yeah and I just feel like you know humans need human contact absolutely I think that's a real challenge now in this modern world where we have lots of remote workers home workers um, and that does have a big impact we always try and encourage face-to-face interaction because as humans we are social creatures we need that actually to survive it's impossible um, to survive without it and it's so crucial to our mental health it's something we stress all the time yeah what do you think about companies so most companies big companies they don't have enough desk space for their employees Mm -hmm. so let's say maybe two-thirds of the amount of desk for their employees yeah they encourage people to work from home this is all cost saving mm-hmm. but dressed up as like we're a really cool flexible company yeah. and then you're living in a big city so people could go through life not really having human contact not knowing their teammates no one really mm. caring how they feel do you think that's contributed to the increase in yeah I think so and also what we call the gig economy of lots of people being freelancers and contractors and not having that security and um, but I think that definitely has contributed I think it's it's great to offer flexible working and sometimes that works in people's favor especially if you have a family for example or other commitments and um, it does help to have the flexibility to have the option to work from home and if you do that one or two days a week no harm done absolutely fine if that is your whole working life working um, on your own in solitary 
that's tough and I think that definitely yeah. has an impact on your levels of well-being and mental health overall yeah interesting so definitely environment yes definitely environment and you know the people that are around us um that is so important as well so our yeah. management our leadership teams are so crucial in forming that environment and making sure it's a conducive one to good work good health etc true people find it quite hard to change the people around them yes the work people it's hard to resign from somewhere but also it's hard to change your your like close circle it could be your friends yeah absolutely could be people that are just having a negative impact on you it's yeah we always to... try and get people to assess that it is hard it, it's a, i mean any kind of change is hard in a way um but we always try and ask people to assess the relationships in their life and if they're contributing to their well-being or sometimes doing more damage than good and then looking at how can we manage that a bit more effectively at work obviously that's harder to control you know the people that manage us the people that work alongside us we don't usually choose those so a lot of the time it's about trying to understand people's behavior a bit better um, and yeah. grow our emotional intelligence have a bit more empathy learn how to work with people of all different personality types and that I think really helps then people kind of settle into that team true it's hard they don't teach that at school they don't teach that at school <laughs> they're starting to they, they are need starting to they need to, to. <laughs> yeah slowly slowly I think that will hopefully change because I still find it astounding actually the amount of groups of adults I work with that have such limited knowledge around mental health um, altogether and I think if we can teach that in school then I think that's amazing because you've already given people the tools that they need to look after their mental health to understand what it is and that we do need to proactively look after it just like our physical health yeah. so yeah hopefully over time that will change it's hard like my I've got a couple of daughters and um my wife was at a party with one of them and mm -hmm. the girl who's party with came up and said um my daughter's called Florence she's like are you Florence's mum and she was like yeah she said I don't like Florence I find her really annoying I don't want her at my party oh no so it's quite interesting it was an interesting scenario right because yeah. most adults um have a problem with knowing someone doesn't like them yes you know like it's a real heart you go to bed thinking oh you know this person doesn't like me how Theresa May does it I don't oh, know. Oh, God. Um, I dread but, to think. <laughs> but so Florence came home and she was like, oh, she's, she's five. She's like, oh, you know, this girl said to, this to me. And I said, well, look, not everyone has good taste. And if she doesn't <laughs> want to play with you, go and play with someone else. Absolutely. Um, but so I was just trying to get this mentality. It's really tough, you know, it's actually, hard, that. Huh? And it, that's never easy to take. But we always try and focus on what is within our control, you know, whilst being authentic, being ourselves. And I think something that, especially adults struggle with nowadays is you know we're always told to be ourselves but often deep down there's this voice going but who is that you know we don't spend enough time with ourselves so our lives are so packed they're so full with activities with with doing that actually it's quite hard to get to know ourselves who we really are and then show that authentic part of ourselves to people and if we do that and they don't like us then so be it there's very little yeah. you know as long as we're not being unkind to anyone um not everybody is going to like you no. um, and that's something that you have to learn to accept and i think the less you can care about that kind of thing the happier you'll be but it's a constant work it's certainly not easy no it's hard it's yeah. hard and then so this links to your other stuff um around sticking to healthy habits yes <laughs> which is really interesting because I was thinking about this the other day when I knew I was going to speak to you mm. and you know I love certain unhealthy things chocolate or whatever yeah we all do <laughs> <laughs> um so how, how, how does it work then how, why do we find it so difficult to stick to these healthy mm. habits so what's important to understand first is kind of how our cognitive systems our brain works in that sense and we have to think of it from the perspective of our ancestors from the hunter gatherers so the brain takes tens of thousands of years to evolve you know we essentially always adapt and evolve to our environment but that takes a long time and we haven't currently evolved to the point where we're able to live that healthily in the environment we're in today which is why I think as a whole we're experiencing so many health problems um, but our brains are driven our, our primary function of our brains is survival so all of the other stuff um, comes secondary really and part of that survival mode is we're, we're incentivized, for example, um, to see, uh, to find out, seek out and eat food. Yeah, so yeah. when there's food in front of us, our initial um, reaction is to eat it because we need food to survive. And back when we were hunter gatherers, food wasn't so easily available, yeah, yeah. especially high fat, high sugar foods that would give us energy. We needed that. So if we saw that, we would immediately go for it. And that hasn't really changed in us. True, yeah, so true. we've got to kind of constantly try and apply this self-control. And our self-control willpower is like a muscle. It gets tired. And we're constantly having to resist 
things in life, the things that we're not supposed to do, the, the drinking, the eating, um, the sitting down for too long. Um, it's it's that constant work of trying to resist that. And we get tired ultimately, and yeah. then we cave in. And the whole environment around us is geared up to selling us stuff, you know, whether that is food or a certain lifestyle or buying certain things. And that certainly doesn't help our case in trying to <laughs> resist those temptations. Very true. No, yeah. I completely agree. So it's hard. And I think, you know, we're quite hard on ourselves. We give ourselves a hard time when we fail, when we don't reach the goals that we want in terms of our health and fitness. But it's important to understand that it's very tough. Our environment does work against us and our brains even work against us when trying to form new habits. Yeah. yeah. And what strategies do, you, strategies do you use to try and keep yourself healthy and so like actively planning is really important um and for for me now it, it is a habit so it's not difficult anymore like every what do you mean like actively planning Are you... so i mean like sitting down and writing it out okay so, right right you know there's so much information that goes through our brains or so much information we're taking in every day when we just actually sit and write something down our brain pays attention to it it realizes that this thing is important so i'm going to remember it and that can make a huge difference there's a lot of research studies to show that when people plan actively around their health in terms of writing down that plan and um, they're much more likely to stick to it so there was a really interesting study done with people who had under, undergone um, hip replacement surgery and they found that those people who wrote down a really detailed plan of recovery for themselves for example how many times a day they would go for a walk how often they would do their physio exercises where they would walk to who they would walk with as the more detailed the more success they had in carrying out and the quicker recovery they made than those who just kind of mentally thought through a plan nice so actively writing down i have one of those brilliant goals diaries which are like handwritten yeah absolutely handwritten like you know this week i'm gonna meditate five times i'm gonna work out four times whatever it might be You're, yeah everyone yeah goals are different yeah but like actively sitting down writing them figuring out where they're going to fit in with my schedule which isn't always easy with we have clients all over the country so it's trying to make sure that I prioritize those things and that they're scheduled in and that makes them much more likely to happen definitely so do you actively schedule in like chill out time exercise time. yeah definitely all of that stuff it's which sounds like I have a life that's really over scheduled <laughs> but actually I leave a lot of room in there so sometimes be spontaneous if that's what I feel like yeah, on that yeah. time but also just to make sure that these like pillars they're the foundation of my life the exercise the the meditation all of those I know if I get those right then the other parts of my life will be much more enjoyable and just kind of fall into place if that makes sense yeah yeah so how much time do you spend meditating and exercising and so I try and you know things happen in life I had a back injury recently which took me out for a couple of weeks but I try on general to do um five to six workouts which includes yoga as well so maybe yeah. like four three or four hip sessions two or three yoga sessions a week um and then I try to meditate daily but realistically it probably ends up being four or five days a week um, and not like for about five minutes. 20 minutes 20 minutes at a time on the weekends I try and do half an hour um and you yeah, use an app to do that or uh, so I use a combination actually so I'm a trained mindfulness teacher so I teach it as well so sometimes I take myself through my own practice sometimes yeah. I use Headspace which is a really great app yeah. which I always recommend to people um, and I have a few other recordings that I draw upon which are on and how phone. do you find it benefits you oh amazingly <laughs> I just have a sense of clarity um, when I meditate that I just don't have otherwise there's running a business as you know there's so much you have to think about all of the time and that can be quite overwhelming and it just helps me feel a lot more grounded and centered um, and also helps with concentration as well I really struggled with that before in that we our concentration spans have got much shorter over time uh, due to various different reasons Definitely. but um, part of mindfulness and meditation is training your concentration span um, and you're always bringing your focus back to the breath, back to the body, whatever it is you're currently focusing on. And that helps massively. It, it helps me be able to carry out work that is meaningful, that I can yeah. concentrate on for a certain amount of time, then helps me get the stuff done that I need to do. Do you find exercise and meditation helps with mental health? Definitely. So... There's a lot of talk around meditation, mindfulness and mental health. Um, and one thing that is really important to point out is it's not a cure for mental illness by any stretch. So if people are 
currently experiencing severe anxiety or depression, we don't recommend that they start a meditation or a mindfulness practice. It's it's too intense. It's a lot of looking inward as well, okay. um, which can be amazing for kind of self-awareness, building your emotional intelligence over time. But that has to be at a time where you feel kind of stable enough to take up that practice. Also, if you're experiencing anxiety, for example, you'll, you'll have a lot of problems concentrating. You won't necessarily get a lot out of the practice. So we we talk about it as a preventative strategy as something that we do like fitness you know you don't start fitness once you've got an injury yeah yeah, so, see, yeah. yeah generally once you're in a, a place where you feel stable it's a great thing to do that can um proactively look after your mental health and keep you in better mental health over time awesome and um, what about the exercise because for me mm. i do i do about four days a week i do uh, crossfit oh great and then i do yoga once a week amazing um i don't meditate I tend to get, I don't know, I like get fidgety pins and needles in my legs if I've crossed them. And but in the normal. in the yoga, they do like five, ten minutes in yeah, the beginning. Absolutely. So Mind, uh, yoga is a form of mindful movement. Yeah. So it is a type of meditation if it's if it's taught correctly. But yeah, exercise is amazing for our mental health. Again, as a preventive strategy. So if someone's severely depressed, suggesting they go for a run isn't going to help them much um, at that point. They probably need professional care before then they can move on to what we call self-care. Um, but yeah, there's been lots of studies to show that exercise as a preventative strategy for mental health um, is amazing. It's really, really good for us. And in terms of our kind of current busy stressful lives yeah. we tend to build up a lot of this chemical cortisol in our systems and because our lives are very sedentary we spend a lot of time sitting down we're not burning that chemical off and that becomes a problem um, in many different areas of our health both mental and physical so exercise is great for burning off that cortisol and just moving you know it doesn't always need to be I say this to people it doesn't need to be you know five hours of working out a week although that's great if you can yeah, but just yeah. getting up in the day going for a walk getting outdoors a bit moving our bodies in the way that they're supposed to be moved yeah no I've got, we've got standing desks oh brilliant I mean, everyone's yeah, sitting that's... right now but um, we <laughs> just awesome. move them up because I slipped three discs in my back Ooh. a while ago and then I got into doing crossfit and it's great now yeah i was doing a lot of running and then i think the pounding on the concrete yeah that's a me. bit hard on the body yeah it's finding but. something as well that works for you your body what you like as well what yeah, you're going to yeah, enjoy um, yeah. and getting through that initial pain barrier with exercise which is tough because when you first start exercising it does not feel good <laughs> <laughs> but the first time it was uh, well i've always liked sport and lots mm. of exercise but i started doing marathon running oh, just wow. after uni with a friend of mine and uh, the first kilometer i got sick Really? And then I ran two kilometers and then I get, and you just build it up. up. You just build it up. So you ran a marathon? Three marathons. Three, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's good cool. for you, yeah. But it's a, it's a really good, um, for my mental health, it was mm. really good, like it's quite meditative. Yeah. You find yourself really in this like, about to sound a bit cheesy, but you get in this like zen state where totally. the thoughts are just coming in and out of your mind and you're thinking about stuff and all you think about my leg hurts or I need to keep mm. going or when's my water stop and yeah it's really hard to think about anything else yeah absolutely a lot of sports like, um professional sports people athletes use mindfulness yeah. as well there's um, a guy called sport. um there's a heavyweight boxer called Tyson Fury yes um and he he's quite public with his um his mental, mental health, health problems yeah. and he almost committed suicide and on the stuff and he was saying in an interview that um he just went five, seven days a week to the gym and he found that it really helped all the endorphins and yeah, the work for him. Absolutely, about, it definitely yeah. does help. Like it's it's one part of the puzzle, let's say. And yeah, um, that's yeah. really important to understand because you know some professional athletes have had mental health illness. It isn't the only thing that's going to protect us from getting unwell. And there's there's lots of reasons. There's past traumas. There's you know other lifestyle choices. There's our environment that can really impact the relationships we have in our life that can impact someone's mental health. So yeah, yeah it should definitely be part of your preventative strategy. It's so so good for us in so many different ways. Um, but yeah, it's by no means the the whole picture. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Makes sense. I think a lot of my mates uh, do no exercise. Yes. Or they let themselves go, <laughs> and they've got every single excuse. Oh, I'm getting married. I've just had a kid. I've just had another kid. Mm -hmm. Haven't got time. All of this stuff. How would how can like people who who really need to start moving and getting a good diet and stuff like reprogram themselves to? Yeah, small like steps I think are really important. So you know it can seem really daunting to think about 
know, suddenly going to the gym five times a week when you don't currently go at all. And the most um, successful changes that people see in their life is when they implement things over time. So it's that marginal gains theory, which also comes from sports of like trying to tweak things just a little bit. So maybe it is like one yoga class a week to start with and just try that. I think sometimes when we set ourselves these really big ambitious goals around exercise and health is when we tend to fall down, you know, saying we're going to cut out sugar altogether. Some people do that successfully fine. But for a lot of people, for a lot of us, if we work in offices where there are cakes, chocolates all the time, resisting that constantly and saying we're never going to cave, I think is unrealistic. Definitely. So yeah. having some, yeah, some some small goalposts that you want to try and achieve and then adding things on slowly. So it might start with one 20 minute run a week and do that for four weeks and then see what you can add in after that. Maybe that's another run. Maybe it's a, a gym workout, whatever it might be. But very small steps, I think, because... For all of us, I think we can all commit to one twenty minutes a week to look after our physical. Well, the one equitable thing is we all have twenty four hours in a day, exactly. And then half an hour. I mean, you can. All, I think everyone can find half an hour in a day. Absolutely, they can. It's it is tough. I do understand, especially taking that first. Um, yeah, step. it's hard to get out the yeah out of the couch. Absolutely, and that you yeah. know there are many days where I wake up and I I think I've got so much to do. I could do with that hour back that I'm going to spend exercising and getting ready. But I just remind myself that I can't afford not to do it. Yeah. Because when I'm sick, you know, there's no one to pay me sick pay, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can't work. You, you're then, you're no good to anyone if you're burnt out or exhausted or sick, which happens when we don't look after our health. So it's constantly reminding myself, and I have to do this too, that it's tempting to skip meditations, exercise. But I know that in the long run, I can't afford not to do that. True, true. Sense. No, it's definitely true. I tend to see a lot of people, they go on, like they do it for a little bit, you know, like January's mm. classic. Yes. <laughs> I hate <laughs> the gym like, in January. <laughs> <laughs> you just see everyone at the gym yeah. and I'm like, hey man, how you doing? <laughs> and then I just never see them again. Yeah. Um, or, or a lot of people go on like, because I think there's a difference between a, a, going on a diet and having a good diet. Mm. And you're like, you see people like they go on a diet, then eat badly, then go on another diet, then eat badly. And it's just trying to get into like a healthy lifestyle. Totally. Like, and, you know, diet culture, again, is something that is sold to us as consumers. It's a way that a lot of companies make money. And you know, so much evidence out there shows that diets just don't work. You know, we have, like you said, a diet. We all have to eat um, but it's trying to make something that's sustainable for you and it's all about how does your body feel so when we teach mindfulness as well we teach a lot around mindful eating and it just is becoming a bit more conscious around how we eat um, so mindful and eating being eating. so it's paying much more attention so a lot of the time especially in modern offices we might eat a sandwich in front of our computers we might eat some biscuits in the afternoon we might eat our dinner in front of the telly we're not concentrating when we're eating and this also leads to overeating and it makes us feel less satisfied from what we're eating so we tend to eat more so with mindful eating it's thinking about you know trying to pay attention when we actually eat thinking about bringing awareness as to why we're making the choices that we are maybe it's the food we like maybe it's habits maybe it's convenience but just bringing awareness to that and then noticing how it makes you feel afterwards and you know our food is our fuel so if you're eating stuff that gives you good energy and different things work for different people some people favor a vegan vegetarian diet some people gluten free whatever it is but it's noticing how it makes you feel and not buying into something because it's a fad but actually what does my body need to to run well to feel good today yeah. and i think when you're eating the things that make you feel good you'll know that you're eating well that's true but then the nice mouth pleasure of a nice piece of chocolate or pizza you know that's okay <laughs> right like <laughs> no, as long true. as you're not eating chocolate for three meals a day like no, no. if you want a bit of chocolate that's not going to kill you i promise you that like don't i think this constant deprivation that we put onto ourselves it's so difficult and it's just being aware as well the world that we live in is very it's very difficult to keep up that constant resistance so don't beat yourself up if you want to have some chocolate after dinner whatever it might be but again work out when when that works best for you like if I'm going to have something sweet I won't have it during the day because it'll crash my energy when I need to work I might have something after dinner um, and I'll enjoy it and I won't feel guilty about it because you know what at the end of the day life is too short sometimes a bit of chocolate is good for the no, no, soul definitely <laughs> no it's so nice yeah on, on, on energy levels because you always mm. see in the workplace people crash at like three o'clock mm. and then they have caffeine and sugar yes which i think is as bad as getting drunk right in terms yeah, of decision making and stuff what, what is there any, what would you recommend people 
So I say, like, especially your your breakfast and your lunch, try and make those meals um, food that is going to give you good energy. So it's trying to avoid kind of too many white, stodgy carbs where possible um, and trying to make sure we're getting plenty of fresh fruit and veg. But sometimes it's also about taking more breaks as well. So we tend not to take that many breaks because we think we've got so much work to do and we don't have time. But if you think about that crash in the afternoon, when we've all been there where we're sitting at our desks, kind of yawning away, feeling so sleepy, you know you're unproductive at that point, right? You know you're not getting your good work done then. And that, that can last an hour, sometimes more. So you think about the time and the productivity you're losing then. If you can just take a couple of shorter breaks earlier in the day get outside get some fresh air that makes such a huge difference you know we weren't designed as humans to operate inside buildings all day so if we can take a quick walk get moving yeah, um yeah. a couple of times earlier in the day that will probably make a big difference Definitely. also we, you know we need to make sure we're looking after our lifestyle as a whole we're sleeping enough so if you're getting a big crash at some point in the day it might be a reflection that you're not getting enough sleep so we've got um, eight hours you should be or? yes ideally do you get, do you get your eight <laughs> um, hours i try so between seven and nine we recommend Seven I try for eight every wow. night. Realistically, it's some somewhere between seven and eight. Usually seven and a half, but I really try not to drop below seven. What time do you get to bed usually? Usually, I try and be in bed around half ten, quarter to eleven. That's right. And then you get up at uh, like half seven, six. Eight? Usually, half six. yeah. So it's yeah. Again, it sometimes varies depending on where I need to yeah, be, but yeah. keeping a good sleep schedule for roughly the same time. And what I try not to do on weekends is sleep in till 10 a.m. because that just screws your schedule yeah, up for yeah, the definitely, week ahead. Definitely. Um, but yeah, that is so important. There, We have a sleep workshop, which I love because... I do. Yeah, people nice. are always... People don't realise this, but our sleep is tied to every part of our health, our memory, our concentration, our immune system. I mean, absolutely everything in our body um, starts to suffer when we don't get enough sleep. So if there's one thing you can change in your lifestyle, like just try and, again... Think of it as a time investment. So those tired slumps that we get um, are really, really damaging to our um, productivity. If we sleep better every night, we'll probably get more back in the day as well. What do you do on your on your sleep uh, training? So we talk about um, a different stages of sleep as well, the cycles okay. of sleep and what they are good for. So we have REM sleep and non-REM sleep, which is the deeper phases of sleep. So we look at what they're useful for. Some really interesting research. So there was so we try and give people a picture of what sleep is doing for us and then what happens when we don't get enough sleep so we reference some really interesting studies one of which talks um, was a kind of wide-scale study where they took different control groups and each different group was allowed a different amount of sleep every night and the most amazing thing that I took from that study is the group that were only allowed six hours of sleep performed um, comparatively worse than the group that were allowed eight hours sleep and they found that after 21 days of sleeping six hours a night it was as bad for our productivity levels as going a whole 24 hours without any sleep does wow. that make sense yeah, yeah. and most wow. people sleep around six hours a night that we come across especially in lots of very high-powered industries law sure. firms banks it's very common that people might get five or six hours of sleep a night but what that's doing to our productivity levels and also our health is so damaging um, so then we look at, okay, how can we build better sleep routines and better wind down routines, looking at our lifestyle as a whole, making sure we understand you know, caffeine, how long it stays in our system, that kind of thing, how important that last hour of our day is. We get people to make a plan for what they can do to make sure they get a better night's sleep um, and looking at everything. So what, not go on Facebook and Instagram? Yes, like... all of that. So no, no <laughs> scrolling before bed. Really? I know it's so hard to oh, do. No. Technology is another one. You know, those... Apps, smartphones are designed to be addictive. They're designed to get us going back and back again. So it is tough. But trying to um, sleep with your phone in a different room if you can, or just not scroll in that? bed. Yeah, I do. do and you? I, I really, I have a novel by my bedside table, and that's what I do last thing before. And it's a very relaxing novel. So sometimes we watch, you know, Luther or Line of Duty, and that's great. But if we watch yeah. that just before bed, and we go, we try and go straight to sleep, our minds can be kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. over um, there. So yeah, trying to just do relaxing things, making sure the environment's right as well. Your room should be cooler than it is during the day, um, clean, uncluttered, all of those things, just to make sure we can get the best night's sleep possible. Yeah, yeah. But really, it's trying to get people to prioritise sleep, to understand its importance, and to make sure that, again, uh, you know, they can't they um, can't afford not to sleep well every night and make sure they are getting enough hours of sleep yeah. is important. The social media thing is tough. Because I yeah. think when I'm... It is tough. My phone's next to my bed. I mm. probably look at it the last thing... 
I do before I go yeah, to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. It it's is bad. hard. And, you know, if you, you feel like you sleep really well and you feel refreshed and energized throughout the day, every day, great. But if you feel like you're not for whatever reason, those are the start, those are things I would start to look at and think, you know, I bought an alarm clock, you know, it's an old fashioned alarm, you know, but it my works. My phone is like, I think the phone's like as addictive as crack. Probably. Oh, totally. They're, yeah. Lots of really interesting Like when that light, light goes again. off, you like, oh no, someone's emailed me and you can't help but like yeah. pick it up. The emails, the email thing is the worst. You know, this wasn't a problem for us 20 years ago. We did not have email access at all hours of the day and you know people work at different times of the day so you might be receiving emails at 9 10 at night and that is what kind of keeps us constantly connected to work and that means we don't really get the proper downtime that we need and that again has an impact on our energy levels throughout the day so making sure you have time a really disciplined um time of the day where you know you're switching off you're not going to be looking at your emails you're not going to be connected to work thinking about work and that will really help you sleep crazy yeah so this is all like after the event right all of the adult we're probably all in bad habits now and we're trying to <laughs> yeah in terms of like our kids and mm. like teaching our kids to be good adults in the future growing up in this world of tech and stuff how can how can we start to get them in good habits right from the beginning yeah Anything absolutely can- i mean look kids don't have the self-discipline or the willpower that adults do which is why we have to kind of enforce certain rules and make sure that there are boundaries there for them so really it's it's our responsibility as adults to make sure that the default um mode of entertainment is not always an ipad or a phone which i know i don't have children so i know it's much easier to say and i know how <laughs> tempting that must be having looked after some before <laughs> yeah. um and you know again that's okay some of the time but yeah when we were children, we just didn't have that. We were allowed to be bored. That let our minds wander. That helped us yeah, be more creative. It helped us play, which I think is lacking in a lot of children's lives today. And, you know, sometimes we take the easier route in the short term, but it leads to more difficult um behavior down the road so just trying to have discipline again a bit of screen time is okay but making sure it's not all the time and having some boundaries clear boundaries around that yeah no that's true it's funny because you see um parents tend to not want their kids to be bored or you always feel like you need to organize something and what we're doing today and and so (laughs) we've tried to do like uh one day every three weeks where we're not planning anything on the weekend that's great and we can just like chill out and do stuff totally yeah adults have that too like we don't like to be bored we think it's a really negative thing um but actually it's it's okay to be bored and that is where a lot of great ideas come from it's where a lot of creativity comes from but we don't give ourselves that space anymore because our lives are so full and even if we're waiting in line for something or waiting for a train we'll be on our phones there is very little time for our brains just to wonder and yeah you know be freer no you're right if i'm queuing up for lunch like just pick your phone up yeah we would do it we would do it again just try and introduce like small habits like saying at lunchtime for example or waiting for the train home i won't pick up my phone and just you know once or twice a day where you commit to not doing it that makes a big difference it's hard it is hard it's not none of this stuff is easy and the key thing i always try and get people to take away is like it's not about being perfect and getting it right all of the time it's about trying to do what you can and getting it right a lot of the time and understanding that at times you know you will fall down like there are times when of course i look at my phone in bed or i miss a workout or have a week where i don't work out and that's okay right you just pick up you start you try again small steps um and you'll you'll get there yeah can you do you ever unplug completely go for a weekend in the country i turn try your phone to off? yeah it is it is tough to do it because we rely on our phones for so much as well like maps for example yeah. you know a lot yeah. of the time when when we're in a new place we rely on our maps to get us about we don't have an old-fashioned paper, paper map yeah. anymore <laughs> there's so many things that you don't realize that you use your phone for calculators you know paying for things it's it's incredible i try to i've actually got a silent retreat coming up in august which is six silent retreat six days and nights with no phones technology but wow but no speaking no speaking for six days for six days (laughs) yeah it's quite terrifying so i've done that for a weekend before but i've never done it for that and are you organizing it or you're attending it no i'm attending it so it's at this lovely retreat in devon and yeah six whole days um which is a terrifying prospect of not speaking to anybody you're not allowed any technology. You're not even allowed books. So it really is just time to wow. meditate and to give your brain some space. So what? So what's going? So it's like yoga and meditation, or yeah, exactly. For for the whole six days, you have teachers who lead the retreats, and they'll take you through some guided meditations. Then you'll do some meditations on your own. You'll do walking meditations, all kinds of different things. But yeah, it's essentially just 
time for for meditation which so is i spoke to someone who time. was going on something similar they'd done two days or something like yeah. that yeah yeah it's an amazing thing to do you it's incredible how refreshed you feel afterwards and have you done it before I've done two days, Sorry but to, not, to yeah, two days, not yeah. to this this length of time. So I'm I'm also a little apprehensive, a bit scared about it. It's a long time, um, and yeah, it's just it's so alien to us because to have a whole six days of not talking or doing anything, and you're going with someone else. No, no, just on my own. On so own, yeah, yeah, because you can't talk to anyone. I think it makes it easier to not have you anyone don't know there people, that you want to yeah, talk definitely. to. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I'm, go- I'm going down on my own. So yeah, it will be quite daunting, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it in a way. When are you going? In August. So. August tends to be a quieter time for business because yeah, yeah. people are on the holiday. So yeah. um, hopefully the world won't fall apart while I'm there. No, no. Awesome. Well, let me know how it is. I will do. Amazing to chat to you. You too. How can people find you? Uh, so we are, our website is weareluminate.co. Um, awesome. So we have uh, some blogs, some resources there. We're uploading some new meditations soon as well, so you can look up for those. Amazing. We're also on social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook as We Are Luminate. So cool. we're posting there as well about things we have coming up. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having Speak me. Speak soon. Pleasure. Bye. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. <laughs> <laughs>